this morning or this afternoon, however way you want to look at it? I'm looking at the clock, Joe, and it's 1536, which really tells you something, doesn't it? It certainly does. Uh, you, know, uh, you are uh, eons ahead of us, uh, though I have a feeling that this Valentine's Day weekend you won't be going out on a hot date with your uh, lovely wife. Uh, that's because, uh, well, are we still shut down over in the uh, you know, freedom-loving country of Austria and across the European Union? No, we've uh, opened up a little bit. You know, it's <laughs> it's been a big thing in the news here. They've uh, basically been trying to get things closed and opened at the same time. It's huh. a very, very strange, terrible strategy. Um, so we ha- do have shops open now, which is great. So we're able to get uh, get some costumes for Carnival, which is a big thing here, Carnival, before Ash Wednesday. And uh, Sunday is the Daytona 500, so you know I'm staying inside. <laughs> You're staying inside, and I'll be outside. And frankly, you know, we'll be uh, hopping around different watering holes. And maybe I'll take a couple uh, pictures at, at the local brewery here later today, so I can, uh, you know, just uh, make you a little jealous and envious uh, of uh, what we're doing here in North Carolina, the semi-lockdown state of North Carolina. Not quite the freedom-loving state of Florida, but we're close. Yeah, I mean, any way that you can get any kind of alcohol outside, I think, is now a measure of freedom. And uh, we don't even have that, unfortunately. (laughs) Obviously, the bars and restaurants are closed. They do offer takeaway service, but they do not allow takeaway service of alcohol, at least at many different areas. So that is something that there are definitely ways to work around. And uh, you bet that's what I'll be doing this weekend, too. Well, you know, the rebel uh, that you are, uh, a reminder to folks, uh, this guy he got uh, the cops called on him uh, in Vienna as he was smoking a turkey uh, during Thanksgiving because uh, you had a Karen in his apartment complex that was a little upset that Yael was out there uh, cooking a turkey uh, in uh, the middle of an empty courtyard, right? Yael, that's uh, the way it played out. Oh, yeah, basically. I mean, uh, people just don't like to, to really smell the beautiful flavors of uh, that North Carolina barbecue. So oh, I, I think barbecue. that definitely was a, <laughs> was a big thing. Everyone, everyone has a weird, strange you know, moment of envy throughout this whole lockdown thing. You know, we do see people traveling. I'm sure many of your listeners have seen people on Facebook or Instagram who might be in Florida or California or, or who knows, somewhere warm and doing something nice. Uh, it's definitely not not like that here, so I do have a little bit of envy there. But it seems as if us being locked up and seeing pictures and images of people enjoying themselves is really not doing well for our mental health. Yeah, and uh, you know, is it more or less like, oh, look at these uh, buffoons in America going out in, in the middle of COVID, or is it the enviousness of uh, you know, oh man, look at those buffoons in America going out and enjoying some of their lives. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's it's definitely the latter amongst all the people that I know. But of course, we're a freedom love freedom loving bunch. But man, I definitely I would kill for that. I know uh, definitely my my brother's down in Daytona for the race over the weekend, and already seeing pictures of how nice it is and the beach and uh, Florida itself. You know, here's here's a place that just had the Super Bowl, going to have the Daytona 500. I mean, this really seems to be the freedom state. I think I even saw a, a nice tweet uh, right after the Super Bowl. Joe, I think you saw this too. It said the real MVP of the Super Bowl is uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Yeah, I would say, and I totally agree. I would say the same. And even uh, you know, a politically minded folks uh, with the Conservative Political Action Conference will actually be meeting later on this month uh, in the state of Florida as well, moving uh, their annual conference from D.C. because they would not be allowed to have it in D.C. So where do you go? Well, you go to Florida. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let me ask you, you know, here in the state of North Carolina, I saw an Elon poll the other day. Uh, folks not real happy with the, the way in which uh, the vaccine, the vaccination process has been uh, rolled out. Uh, and uh, you've got our county commissioners, for instance. Oh, there was a couple extra doses in this last batch. Uh, so let's go get uh, vaccinated. You, know, you see people, of course, the elites and others uh, getting a, an opportunity to be vaccinated before, you know, my 70 year old uh, you know, mother-in-law. Uh, nonetheless, uh, this is the way things go, I guess. If you've got influence, if you've got money, if you're a part of the elite status, uh, you get to jump uh, to the front of the line. Or if now you're a teacher and you're beholden to the Association of Educators and the teachers' unions, you are now being prioritized uh, without even being engaged as to whether or not you would take uh, the vaccine. I mean, what a mess uh, we've got going on here as far as the vaccination program goes. In our state, many others like it. And, you know, we can forget about talking about where you're at in Austria and the way things are going there. Yeah, and I think North Carolina provides us some very good examples. Now, granted, we are doing better 
in North Carolina compared to some of our neighbors, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee. So North Carolina has about 10% of the population that's already had one dose. And I do have a good number of friends, of, of colleagues, of people that I know who've had their first dose in North Carolina. There are other places where it's definitely a lot worse. And I think you know there's there are a lot of issues with how these things are distributed. Uh, there was one article that came out in the Associated Press about a couple of people in South Carolina uh, who were over able to get to North Carolina and able to get vaccines. It was one particular gentleman who's, I think, 75 years old. Uh, he didn't really have a shot in South Carolina because it's going so poorly, so he had to drive up north to North Carolina. And uh, that's around the Charlotte area where people are border hoppers there. People generally buy gas in one uh, state or buy their groceries in another, depending on the taxes. So I totally understand that, and I don't begrudge it. I mean, look, if I was... Um, at least at, at some risk for my health or I was a bit older, I'd be jumping over every line possible to get one of these vaccines. And I think, uh, fortunately, in North Carolina, it, it's gotten a lot better. I mean, 10% is better than the average of the EU. It's certainly better of where I am right now. Uh, but if we look at places like California and Texas, there actually have been many circumstances where they are trying to distribute this according to equity. Uh, meaning we're not just looking at high-risk groups of people who might be 65 or older. They're also looking into racial demographics, socioeconomic factors, and that seems to me a little bit dangerous. And we don't really have the model of, of how we normally do things in our marketplace. Things are decentralized. We use demand. You know, We allow as many distributors as possible. Uh, I know that uh, Andrew has been on here various times talking about West Virginia, which is now one of the most vaccinated states in the entire nation, and they work with the local pharmacies. We're not really doing that in North Carolina. There's there's a lot of you know individual health alliances and you know departments that are distributing this, and it seems really haphazard. I wish they would do a, a bit of a better job that way. I mean, we could learn from the market and how to distribute this stuff. There's a reason last week, Joe, I was praising Amazon, and uh, yeah. another reason is because yeah. I think if. We handed over the vaccinations to them. Uh, yeah, this stuff would be done pretty quick. We'd probably be done by uh, next Tuesday. You young whippersnappers in your Amazon.com and your Amazon Prime. I mean, uh, maybe one day, Yael. You almost uh, had me yesterday with uh, the bottle of uh, cafe coffee-flavored Patron tequila that I can't find anywhere on the shelves uh, here in the uh, you know the progressive state of North Carolina and their updated uh, ABC and liquor laws. So you, uh, you almost got me uh, to make a purchase on Amazon yesterday. Still have not visited that site, by the way, since we last caught up. <laughs> well, and, and you won't be able to find any any liquor there. So uh, no alcohol on Amazon, at least in, in North Carolina. Believe me, oh, I've been trying. Okay. I've been pushing at the state legislature. I've been trying to talk to many state legislatures themselves. It's really slow, but... I tell you, where I'm sitting right now, I could add 10 of them to my cart and ship them to you, and you would get it uh, probably quicker than this will be available ever online. So that, that's definitely one thing to work towards. Hopefully, in the pandemic, we're learning that a lot of laws that we've had <laughs> up until this point were never really needed. And I think those around the alcohol monopoly that we have, specifically in North Carolina, is definitely one that we could axe. I really hope the the state legislature there works on it. They've talked about it a little bit. They're giving us teases. But come on, guys. This is uh, – we're 2021. This is something that, that people have been demanding for a long time. It's the time to do it. Why not? Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you, as I, I comb through a story and we're talking about the vaccination rollout, uh, doctors uh, now telling us uh, more and more physicians – this is from CNBC.com, by the way. You know, no uh, you know, right-wing conservative uh, you know, publication. More and more physicians and public health officials are warning that even with the mass rollout of vaccines – COVID may become endemic, uh, meaning that uh, you know, we're going to learn have to, to have to live with it uh, one way or the other. Uh, here we are a year into this whole thing. You know, At the beginning, this time last year, all right, there was some uncertainty, 14 days to flatten the curve and, and all of that. Uh, but I can recall a time not too long ago when uh, President Trump's uh, chief of staff, Mark Meadows, was on one of the uh, talk shows Sunday morning, and he said, listen, you know, even with the vaccine, we're going to have to learn to live with it. And the guy was demonized, criticized. He wanted They wanted to tar and feather the dude. And now, of course, you know, we're, we're hearing what we all kind of knew in the long run, whether we wanted to embrace this or not, that ultimately 
Uh, viruses are going to virus, and bacteria is going to spread, and uh, we're going to have to figure out a way to manage our risk assessment. We've got therapeutics, we've got vaccinations uh, for all sorts of different infections, you know, uh, tuberculosis, HIV, you know, other uh, coronaviruses, the flu, for instance. You know, we're lear- we've learned to live with all of these types of things. Why is this such a, still, you know, a, a polarizing thought that we're going to have to figure out a way to move forward, onward and upward, uh, even with COVID-19? I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that this debate is no longer medical. It's not about viruses. It's not about viral spread. It has everything to do with power. It has everything to do with control. And while many of us have have definitely, look, we've accepted it. We're wearing masks. We've followed all the rules as much as we can. Maybe there are a few that we've broken in our own time. Uh, But everything that's been reasonable, reasonable people have followed. Uh, But when they just start discussing the idea of even when we get to herd immunity and we get mass vaccination, that we're not even going to get to normal, uh, that actually does fly in the face of all the scientific studies that flies in the face of what our scientists are telling us. So that's when you know that they're straying from science, they're straying from what health authorities are saying, and it has everything to do with power. And I would probably add another controversial point, Joe, is that uh, many health professionals, you know, they've never really had it better. They've never been more invited to be on media, on television shows, they get their op-eds printed, Mm. everyone listens to what they say. So we have to think about that. Everything is about incentives, and we have to really think about the totality of our society. Everyone has their own interests. Definitely teachers' unions are making that very clear in places like Chicago and various other states where they're not allowing kids to go back to school. There's really got to be an examination of the power dynamics here. And the more and more power that we're granting our governmental agencies – These are not powers that will just easily shed away once all this ends. And we have to really be sure that we keep our institutions accountable. Uh, This is not just a a blanket takeover. This is something that we cannot just address with emergency legislation all the time. We have to continue to adhere to the Constitution, but also to the primal health directives that we have. And we can't really allow, uh, you know, the tyranny of the experts to go on either. You know, there is all kinds of of evidence that's entered and given by scientists, but they do not run government because their interest is scientific research and knowledge. So I think uh, that's something that's often lost, Joe, in in the entire scheme of things. Yeah, and it's just the the mixed messaging we've been hearing, uh, you know, from the very get go on all of this. Uh, Yeah, yeah, you a big double masker or not yet? (laughs) No, no, I I have uh, just this uh, little F. FP2 mask that's now uh, mandatory here. So I'm the single mask, but uh, I just wear it wherever it's required. I mean, look, Joe, I, ha- I don't really see anybody. Uh, I talk to you <laughs> through the radio here. Uh, you know, I go bring my daughter to her kindergarten. That's really about it. Uh, Everything else is just online, playing the stock market, doing consumer choice all day. I'm not visiting people, Joe. I don't need two masks. Oh, boy. Yeah. Well, I yearn for the day that you're able to enjoy yeah, a nice cold beverage with me along the banks of the Cape Fear River. We need to do it again very soon. Yeah, at this point, you know, this is uh, it's probably going to have to be our exit plan, our European Union exit plan, and uh, hopefully we can get some vaccinations there. I've got friends who have gotten vaccinations all over the place in other countries, and, and you know, if it takes a an air, airline trip to come to North Carolina to get it, well, that's exactly what we might have to do, and we'll be hanging out in Wilmington soon. Yeah, yeah, let me ask you, you know, we hear in Congress uh, that uh, another, uh, what is it, the $1.9 trillion uh, piece of legislation that has been floated out by the Biden administration and uh, all sorts of bills and whistles have been added on by the Democrat majority you know, in the House and the Senate. And when we look at the impact that this will have on consumers, you know, by the way, there is still, according to Congressman Rouser this morning, there is still a trillion dollars, one trillion dollars of money uh, that has been unspent from the previous stimulus bill, quote unquote stimulus bill. And now we've got another two trillion coming down the pipeline. Uh, what's the impact on consumers here you know, at the end of the day as to whether or not this is really you know, going to stimulate our economy and get us back up and running the way we were you know, a couple of years back? Well, I really like the point made by Dave Ramsey this week, who also is on Big Talker uh, throughout the day. And he made the point that, you know, with these small number of stimulus checks, 
whatever it is, sixteen hundred dollars or fourteen hundred dollars. I mean, if if you're really in a precarious position, this stuff is not going to help you. And if you're so deadly in need of the six hundred dollars, then you had other problems before. So I think a lot of consumers, especially, are are really looking at this and saying, well, is that really how I'm being served? The pri the primary goal of this should be to reopen our economy to make sure that people can get back to work so that we have clarity. I'm happy to see that there is a lot of money that is going to small business, but I think uh, you've had Brad Palumbo of Fee on this week and or last week, and he's definitely discussed the problems with a lot of the bill and where the money is going and how much money is being wasted. Uh, thankfully, there are a lot of great small businesses that have been able to reap some rewards, but there's also future debt to keep in mind. There's a lot of this that's that's really making it difficult to understand what is the goal of the government here. And any of these large trillion dollar plans, there's a lot of stuff we're not going to be able to see until it's too late. Uh, there's going to be too much money kind of rolling around in the system that you or I are not going to be able to to be able to to really get what I guess would be deserved. Uh, this is a lot of money. This is the largest uh, financial bill basically ever conceived. So we really have to understand, you know, what the future of this is, how we as consumers are going to be impacted. Uh, I know they're talking about the minimum wage and raising that as well. So it really is something that impacts a lot of people. I would hope, I would hope that we have a future way to go forward. Sorry, Joe, that's my my oh, daughter trying to get in on the conversation. Hey, man, just, she agrees with me. Yeah, you're adding some you know real life experience to all of this. Uh, you know, it's not Yael sitting in his high perch. It's Yael, the dad, who has going to go change a diaper here in about five minutes after you know we jump off the air with them. Uh, that brings a, a a reality kit to what we do. You know, not just here behind the microphone all the time. Uh, spouting this, that, and the other. Uh, yeah, yeah, when you talk about that uh, stimulus, you know, it, it, and the way I look at it, too, you know, on the on the back end, as you said, with Dave Ramsey, you know, 600 bucks, 1200 bucks. Uh, you know, if you're dying for that money to come into your bank account, uh, you know, there's something else that's going on there that you need to figure out financially. And, and there are instances where there are people out of work and they can't find work or, or you know, they're in uh, dire straits, they've been living paycheck to paycheck. But again, it goes back to the root and the fundamentals of things when we talk about financial literacy. And on the on the other end of the scale, you know, if you're making seventy five thousand dollars a year, a family's making one hundred forty eight thousand dollars combined. You don't need twelve hundred dollars either or six hundred dollars to, to float you for a, a couple of weeks. Uh, it, it seems just like, uh, well, it seems as if they're just trying to uh, pump us up with this money for something maybe down the pipeline, uh, you know, in the future, as far as, you know, the way uh, the government provides income to its uh, population. Uh, we've heard these ideas, uh, the universal basic income uh, type of uh, conversation by the Andrew Yangs of the world. Is that kind of the precursor? Is Are we living in the precursor to that uh, or is uh, am I looking too far into it? I mean, it's definitely something that exists in many other countries, uh, not to that extent, but that model works. And, and you know, we're, we're going to have to pay for this somehow. And once we get to a point where we are paying taxes on European level, something like 60 percent, then, yeah, essentially, you know, all of our society is going to be centralized and controlled by governmental agencies, which is what we do not want. We want to have consumers who have disposable incomes. We want to have citizens who have freedom and individual liberty. And if we continue to grow the government and – look, the only thing we want – we don't want money from D.C. We want clarity and we want things to be open. That's the, that's the number one concern here. Get rid of the virus. Get us back to work. Any of this other stuff is just more money that's being thrown into the system. It's going to help some people float, uh, but really it's going to be problematic down the road. And I would hope we can uh, have some good advocates for our ideas for limiting all of this excess – I really hope that we have good people who can help us defend us on that, Joe. Yeah, Yell, as I let you go, and we can't go a segment with the Consumer Choice Center without talking about support for medical cannabis. And as we move into you know that realm of the discussion, apparently a majority of North Carolinians, I can't believe we still don't have medical marijuana here in the state, while others have just opened the floodgates for anyone and everyone to you know purchase you know. <laughs> you know, purchase a J or whatever else you want uh, at your consumption recreationally. But a majority of North Carolinians actually do support uh, medical ca cannabis. Apparently, is this you know a, a topic that people are, are are looking into or you know pushing here in the state? I know. Uh, so this is a, an Elon University poll from the last week in January, and uh, if we look at medical 
you know, it's 73 percent of North Carolinians that are in favor of medical marijuana, 73 percent of people in North Carolina. Uh, when we look at recreational, it's actually 54 percent. So it still is a majority. Uh, there are some people who are talking about this a bit in Raleigh. Um, it's mostly the opposition because they're just hoping to get some donations and flashy stuff. I, I would hope that we would have more Republicans that would come to this side. When it comes to medical, we're talking about patients, and we're tra talking about giving additional choice to patients. So I think that's something that's very important. I know Tom Tillis has uh, definitely not been uh, supportive, uh, you know, as a U.S. senator for North Carolina. So I, really, I really hope we can change his mind. This is only about trying to increase uh, the access of this new medicine to patients. That's just the medical side. We have to get to the medical side yeah. and make sure we can do this. We can have the debate about recreational later. I definitely have had that debate with uh, some fellow hosts on this station, too. So I would, I would really hope that we can just bring the conversation forward. Yael Lasowski with the Consumer Choice Center, uh, the global grassroots movement for consumer choice. You can find out more about what they do at ConsumerChoiceCenter.org and tune in to Yael and his co-host David Clement uh, tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock, uh, here on the Big Talker FM for Consumer Choice Radio. Yael, it's a pleasure. And uh, you know the first uh, pint today at my watering hole will be in honor of you, sir. So have a great day, and I will as well. Thank you so much, Joe. Cheers to you. All the best. And it's great to have Yael Asowski as part of our program uh, every Friday just after. Humphreys from the Humphreys Law Firm on Eastwood Road. The Humphreys Law Firm is located in